be with you this morning as we continue our services online. Today we thought that we would just scale everything back um, and just take a moment to pause and worship before the Lord. I know these times have been so uncertain, um, but one thing that we do know is that our God is certain, that He is faithful, that He, the words that He says is true. Um, and so while other things seem to be up and down, we know that our God is constant, that he, his love for you, his love for me, his love for the church is never changing, never ending. And so um, would you just uh, in, invite the Lord's presence in your home or wherever you may be watching and just worship with me today as we honor him. Amen.
Hey, what's up, New Hope Community Church? My name is Pastor Pat, and I am bringing you your announcements this morning. Can I say just thank you again for joining us this morning? We love having you here. So if you feel free, write certain things that really touch you within worship. Maybe you're asking for information during announcements and want to get connected. Hey, maybe even you got some um, things that are just firing from our message, so you want to just go and give an amen during that. Please enter that in the chat, wherever you're watching from, whether it be YouTube or Facebook account, and right now live on our website. Well, if this is your first time, uh, we welcome you. We're so thankful that you're here. We ask that you would uh, jump in and get connected because we're a church that loves being connected um, from staff to attendee. Um, to elder, uh, we love being those that are connected. So if this is your first time, your hundredth time, hey, we got things you can fill out. You can fill out um, our connection card, which is uh, by clicking that tab that says connect, you can get connected. Hey, you need prayer? Because we want to pray for you. You can click that tab that says prayer. And um, let's just be a community that's connected to one another. I know times are tough, I know it's still hard, and we don't know whether we can go, go back to parks or whether we can go back to church or whether we can go back to uh, school. But we do know that God sits on the throne. He is our King, and we have a community here that wants to stay together. So if you can get connected with us, we'd love to be connected with you. It's gonna be an awesome time. Well, let's jump into our announcements. A couple quick ones, we have youth ministry still happening on Zoom on Sunday night. And if you want any information, um, please let myself know. You can email me at patrick at newhopecommunity.tv. What we have are men's Bible study half things every Saturday morning at 6.30. So if you're a guy out there who wants to get to know um, the Bible a little better and just read with fellow, fellow men, um, please let us know and we'll get you that information. Email ohana at newhopecommunity.tv and we'll love to give that information to you. It's which leads me to the ministry I want to highlight this week in our announcement, which is Children's Ark. Children's Ark Ministry has been doing such an amazing job during this time of COVID-19 and the pandemic. With everyone staying home, it's been really hard to really, you know, meet with children every Sunday. But man, our team has found a way. And with their leader, Annie, um, at the helm. They've done such an amazing job um, bringing the Bible, the gospel, the good news to our children at New Hope Community Church. So if you know Annie, if you know anyone on the team, hey, send them your love, write it in the chat, text them, call them up, um, let them know what an amazing job they've been doing. Well, uh, we've been doing VBS as a church. The Children's Art Ministry has been doing VBS and doing an amazing job. I got a few pictures here that I want to show right now of some of the kids it's coming up um, enjoying VBS. They got their t-shirts and their programs and they're gathering around the computer, um, really leaning in to what God has for them. And it looks like such a great time, great job team. Well, let's just transition into our time of tithes and offerings. Again, this is just a time where we, as God's people, um, get to worship Him and give unto Him. And um, I know it might seem like this is just something that is a box to be checked or something that we do every week, but this is something personal between you and God. It's another thing to grow our relationship with the Lord, to grow our trust with our God. And so when you, um, as we pray and as we give and as we prepare to give of our tithes and offerings, May you just know this, you are worshiping God like a song unto heaven. You're saying, God, I, I worship you. And so um, thank you. Thank you for being those that are willing to step into a place of obedience and a st step into a place of giving. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you first exampled the heart of giving. That from the very beginning, you gave and gave to your people. 
And though as people we have made mistakes and mistakes and mistakes, you continue to give and give and give. And whether that is forgiveness, Lord, whether that is redemption, whether that is a blessing, you continue to give. And so in turn, God, may we find a way to give um, to your cause, to your kingdom, to your advancement, to your name. We worship you, Lord. We ask that you bless the giver. May you bless those that are willing to step across the line of obedience and give unto you so that the name of Jesus can be proclaimed um, in this community. We love you, Lord, and we just want to have a genuine uh, relationship with you. And so uh, in this time of tithing and offerings, may you be praised. Pray this in your name. Amen. Well, I have the privilege of announcing or bringing up our uh, speaker this week. He hails all the way from Hawaii Kai, and um, you may know him, you may not know him, but I can tell you this much. From what I know of our pastor that is speaking and bringing the word of God is that he is genuine. When he speaks, he speaks from a place of depth that he has gone to, to meet with God, to hear his word and deliver it to his people. So from your home, from your couch, from your chair, from wherever you are right now, if you can get ready to receive from the one and only pastor of New Hope, Hawaii Kai, Pastor Pat McFall. Aloha New Hope Community Church. I'm Pastor Pat McFall and a pastor over at New Hope Hawaii Kai. Now I know most of you, but I know I probably haven't met many of you. And so I'm just super honored to be here. And in fact, our church over at New Hope uh, Hawaii Kai is joining us together. Also, uh, I just love this kind of partnership that we get to have. It's been amazing seeing, even in the challenging times that we're in, the level of partnership that we've seen with just churches and pastors on the east side. And I tell you what, I love your pastor. I love Pastor John and Pastor Renee. I love your team. We have been praying for you Family, we remember that a few years ago, you guys planted out from the east side in the Aina Haina, and we continue to pray for you and celebrate you. We love you, and I just love that we can continue to do this together. Amen? Come on, well, let's get ready. Look, if you are from New Hope Community Church, if you're from New Hope Hawaii Kai, if you're just watching it, you just happen to come on this thing, in the chat, in the comments, wherever you can let them know. Let us know who you are. Let us know where you're from. We'd love to hear that interaction and engagement. Uh, it just makes the service a little bit more fun and engaging while we're doing all this together. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to continue the Sermon on the Mount series uh, for Pastor John and the team. You guys have been digging deep in the words of Jesus. And so I'm excited to jump in in Matthew chapter 7. And so right now, let's take a look at that. If you got your Bibles, it'll probably come up in the screen below or wherever, but open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, and then we're going to kind of get jumping in. But I want to tell a story first, and it's this. Look, uh, when I was a, a young kid, I did gymnastics. You know, I, was a, I wasn't a football player. I'm 5'4". It's just the way it goes, okay? Wasn't playing basketball. I do have a pretty decent vertical. It's like watching a leprechaun jump real high. It's awesome. So uh, I didn't, I was a gymnast, if you can imagine. I want you to take a, a moment to imagine me in a leotard. You're welcome. Okay, so now I trained. I did good. I had a measure of success. I thought I knew my sport. That was until I met Mr. Sakamoto. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mr. Sakamoto had coached Olympic level gymnasts. I wanted to step it up in my sport. And so I went to Mr. Sakamoto and he took me on. I was his protege. At first, he wasn't sure. He kind of looked at me like, I'm not really sure about this kid, but I was determined. And so I was excited to show him what I knew. So he asked me to do some things on the vault and on the floor. And I tumbled and I did these tricks and these tumbling passes. And he said, you know what? No, no, no your basics are all wrong. I need you to do a cartwheel. I was like, what? I started doing cartwheels when I was like four years old, man. You don't know me, right? So I'm doing cartwheels and I think that's enough. Like, okay, it's been a week, I've done cartwheels, but then it's two weeks and then it's three weeks and then it's four weeks. Look, I did cartwheels. I did the most basic 
gymnastics movements for three months straight. I thought I knew my sport. Apparently, I had, didn't know anything at all. I didn't know my fundamentals were all messed up. I didn't know that I had things that I needed to fix at the basic level that would uh, give me the ability to do other things in my sport. I thought I, I, I thought I was flexible until Mr. Sakamoto started putting 45 pound plates on my back just so that I could get my split completely down. That's right, your boy Pat McFall used to be able to do the splits. If I tried it now, I'd be in the ER. I thought I knew my sport. I thought I knew what training was. I thought I knew, but I found out really quickly in that season, even as a young kid, I had no idea. I, I needed to relearn. I needed to actually assess what I actually thought I knew. <laughs> Look, in the most important relationships in our lives, I don't want us to be like, well, I thought I knew my wife, but I guess I didn't. I, I thought I knew my son, but I guess I didn't. I thought I knew my friends, but I, apparently I was all wrong. In the most important relationships in our lives, I want, I want for me and for you, I want to be able to say confidently, no, I know who they are, and I know what they mean to me. How much more in our relationship with Jesus? How much more in our faith? You know, the problem is that people, I think, think that they know God. <laughs> we do. And sometimes when you know something, you forget what it's like to learn something. And then you just assume that you've got it down. You know, maybe, but the thing is, is we have a lot of different understandings of God in this time. Maybe, maybe we're, we real, all we really know is the God that is just pretty much like any other God. That's kind of like pluralism. That's like everybody's got a seat at the table and we all party together and we're all going to end up at one place at one time at some point. Well, that's a God. It's not the God of the Bible. Another God is maybe the God that just want, makes me want to be happy. That's an awesome God. He's really interested that I'm in a good mood all the time. Well, that's a God, but that's not the God of the Bible. That's a different kind of religion. We got pluralism. That's called hedonism. Certainly fun. There are some consequences to that worldview, though. How about the God that I just ask for when I need help? That is the beautiful religion of escapism. Get me out of this jam. I need help. I'm throwing up a Hail Mary. The God that I just talked to when I need some help. Well, what about the God that makes me a nicer person? Well, well, now we go from escapism to moralism. And definitely, I think Jesus wants us to be better people. I think he would even say, you know what? If you were nicer, that'd probably be a good, a good start. But then we're talking moralism. We're not talking the God of the Bible. Because then when we try and do things on our own and our own efforts, what? Now it's a religion or a faith based in works. And that's not the gospel. The unique position of the gospel story in all of the world is that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. Not of our works so that we can't even boast. God gets all that credit. So what's the answer? If that's the problem, what's the answer? Well, I think it's the truth. <laughs> Jesus said that, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus was really clear that he was the doorway that we get to walk through in order to know the Father. Really, the path leads to him and is through him. And the truth sets us free. And, and it's follow through on that truth. It's the response. What do we do with this truth that we know? Jesus speaks to this reality in Matthew 7. He says this, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. On judgment day, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons, exercise the demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Come on, Jesus. Why are you going to be like that? Let's take it one verse at a time, though. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. 
See, faith may start with passion, but it will only grow with obedience. What is Jesus talking about here? Saying that not everybody who says, Lord, I'm recognizing you as someone who has authority, who's important, who maybe I should, maybe even example that I should follow, but not, those people aren't going to get into the kingdom of heaven, only those that do what? That actually do the will of the Father. So he's talking about obedience. Faith born out of like emotion, but there's nothing wrong with emotion. Our faith should be emotional. Like there's passion behind what we believe and excitement when God brings transformation. But faith that's born out of emotion has to be nurtured through endurance in obedience. Uh, uh, one man said it this way, Eugene Peterson, he described faith as long obedience in the same direction. A follow-through, a consistency, not a perfection, but a long obedience in the same direction. Jesus is saying that obedience is key. Jesus will continue. And what's amazing, I love the, this section of scriptures because we, we already are in this, this amazing, and everybody loves the Sermon on the Mount, man. Give me those Beatitudes, man. The, the meek will inherit the earth. Blessed are the hungry, the, the poor in spirit. Oh, yeah, but now Jesus is kind of getting down with, the, with, with some nitty-gritty truth here. He says this, on judgment day, I don't want to hear about judgment day, man. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and we perform many miracles in your name. Look, there is no gift or strength that will supply a lack of genuine obedience. There is not one area of success in our life, one beautiful conquering moment, a reputation so stellar that will supply the lack of genuine obedience to Jesus and who He is. And this is what's so challenging is that Jesus is saying it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not me. It's not Pat. It's not uh, some other. It's Jesus in his own words, which is so beautiful that we have the words of Jesus that we can process together and learn from. But then we have to actually wrestle with what is he saying here? And it can be really, really challenging. There's no performance that can disguise the lack of true presence. I mean, it is possible. Jesus is saying right now that it is actually possible for someone to know God and perform miracles and still not be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Well, then who gets in, man? Like, what's going on here? And this is what's so interesting is that Jesus is very aware of the natural and the supernatural. Jesus was not just a nice guy. At least that's not what the Bible says. That's not what we believe. We actually believe that he was the son of God. And one of the reasons why we believe that is because Jesus said that he was. He was the son of God. He said, no man gets to the father except through me. And now Jesus is like saying, look, there is, there's a supernatural realm and it interacts with our natural realm. And there are powers that exist that are not God. They're evil. They're from the enemy. And people are able to access those things and perform miracles and completely miss the point and the actual power of Jesus. And this should really challenge us. It's one thing if we're talking to people who don't believe in God at all, and maybe that's some of you watching right now. Maybe you're like, I'm not, I don't really know where I land on faith, on the, on, on Jesus, on, on Christianity or organized religion. But Jesus is saying that he's the only way. And that even the miraculous, even Jesus walked in the miraculous, and actually we have the ability to see Jesus do miracles through us today. But at the end of the day, it's obedience that grants us entrance. You know, what's interesting is that Somebody else in the, the Old Testament kind of had this challenge because uh, he was successful. And he was frustrated when he came up against like his, his lack of obedience, his lack of character, and his success. And, and his name was Saul, and he was a king before David. 
And there's this moment in Saul's life where he's waiting. He's actually, he, he's just taken over this town. He's done in his mind what he feels like God has asked him to do. And he's waiting to actually for the priest, for Samuel the priest and the prophet to come and actually sacrifice to the Lord to do this act of worship because that was his role. But instead of waiting for Samuel, Saul actually says, you know what, I'm going to just take care of this. I'm just going to do it. And right when he's finishing up, Samuel walks up. He, he, he's experiencing, he's seeing and witnessing this disobedience to God's directive. And what does he say? Well, he says this, What is more pleasing to the Lord? Burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Saul is like many of us. We're like, wait a minute, but don't you see my success? I just I had a big win here. Like, I'm good. I did a miracle here, Jesus. I provided here, God. Can't you see? And he says, no, no, no. I don't need your sacrifice. I don't need any more of your songs. I don't need your elaborate displays of faith. All that I'm really looking for is simple, simple obedience. I just, Jesus <laughs> cuts through all of the confusion. And he allows us to connect with such a simple, powerful reality that when I simply respond to his voice, I get where I need to go. Look, there's no success at work that's going to replace my presence with my kids. There's no crowd that I could preach in front of. There's no ministry moment in my life, a success. There's no book that I could write that's going to replace my need to be obedient as a present, loving father to my kids. I don't want to come to the end of my life or anywhere in the middle of my life all to think, wait, I thought we had this relationship, but actually, apparently we didn't because I prioritized other things. I don't want to think that just because I'm providing materially for my kids that somehow that is good enough presence for them. No, no, no. Like my kids want me. My wife wants me. How much more does the God of the universe want us? Family, he died for us. That's the beautiful, incredible, amazing news of the gospel is that we couldn't reach God. And so God reached out to us through his son, Jesus on a cross, forgiving our sins so that we could know eternal life. It's right here. So what does Jesus respond? How does he respond? So these guys that are saying, Lord, 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 he says, but I will reply, I never knew you. I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. <laughs> Look, what is Jesus saying? He's saying basically, family, there is a day. There is a day of judgment. Jesus said it. There's a day when justice will be complete in God's plan for humanity and for all creation. And on that day, many people who assumed, who thought they knew, will find that Jesus never knew them. And what it boils down to is not whether they performed better in life, not whether they had a great reputation in the town they grew up in, not that they were able to be miraculous and they were the most dedicated religiously. It's whether or not they simply did what Jesus asked. Even Jesus says it in another place in the New Testament. Why do you call me Lord, but you don't, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do? And this is a really challenging thing for believers, for those of us who feel like, hey man, I'm at the table. I'm in, it's great, it's awesome. Because it causes us to really assess ourselves. 
I never knew you. See, Jesus uses comparison and repetition all over this. He's already talked about good fruit and bad fruit and good trees and bad trees and wide roads and narrow roads and gates. And he's talked about true and false prophets. And he's, he's talked about uh, uh, the, the, the unstable foundation of sand versus the building your house on the solid rock. And all of those pictures, those repetitive pictures of comparison, all speak to the nature of true discipleship. So that's what Jesus is sort of getting to in this place in scripture. He talks about the golden rule, all kinds of good stuff. And notice this, these guys are saying, Lord, 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 Lord. I mean, they're recognizing his authority. They're recognizing uh, some type of, uh, of, of, you're not just a normal person kind of a moment. And then they say this in your name, they say in your name. We perform miracles in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did all this stuff in your name. Here's the problem. They assumed on a relationship that they had with God. They assumed that because they could say his name that they really knew who he was. I, I don't want to be found in that day realizing that I placed my hope in things that are as in unstable as sand just running out of my fingers. I don't want to build my life on a foundation that is dependent on my success. There is a whole eternity waiting for us. And Jesus is trying to get the point across. He's not trying to keep people out. He's trying, to, he's trying to let you know this is how you get in, but it's not a wide road. It's actually a narrow one. See, you can't fake true intimacy. We can't fake true intimacy. <laughs> Jesus is saying, when he says, I never knew you, <laughs> the word never, <laughs> it means never. <laughs> He's saying that I never, that Greek word meaning at no point in history, in the concept of time, at no point have I, never have I known the gnosko, never have I known, or that word is, is experienced as a knowing, experience, it's like a relational connection. Never at any point in time, with all your performing, with all your miracling, with all of your exercising, with all of the things, never at any moment did I experience you. They may have had plenty of experiences, but they missed the one experience that really counted. Family, it, it, this is actually good news because it sets us free from trying to perform our way into God's good graces. But it is sobering to think that unless we're willing to come face to face with how much we actually need Jesus, that we might miss it. We can't fake that kind of intimacy. We got to put the effort in, right? Like, like I just think of my wife, right? Like if, if I, like, if I haven't talked to my wife in a week or two, if I haven't had conversations with her, I haven't complimented her, or not just that, my wife doesn't need grand gestures of romance. I mean, she likes those things, but she really just appreciates the consistent words of affirmation and love that I give her. And there are times that I'm doing better at that than others, but let's say that I haven't. Let's say that I haven't talked to her at all, haven't conversed with her. I've kind of high-fived her in the hallway while I'm going to work and she's doing whatever, dealing with now the kids being at home because they're not in school and all that stuff. But then later, now it's been a couple weeks of that, then later I roll up on my wife and I put on that 90s R&B, oh yeah, because I'm thinking, man, you look good, and maybe I'm even saying, Lord, Lord, but you know what you might say to me? Fool, I don't know you, using the words of Jesus on me like that. I don't, where have you been for the last two weeks, bro? 
I've been doing this. You haven't even said hi to me. I haven't deposited into the intimacy, into the relationship. See, I can perform the act of physical intimacy, but have a complete disconnection emotionally and spiritually. And that's what I don't want. Look, (laughs) I'm not saying that that intimacy should be transactional. I do this, so you do that and this and that. What I'm saying is simply this. You cannot fake true intimacy. We can't fake it. We can't fake real friendship. We can't fake real relationship. So what do we got to do? Well, number one, I want to encourage us. Let's slow down. I think we got to slow down. What do you mean? We're all at home. Everybody's slowing down. I want to ask you, how slow have you been since you've been home from work because of COVID? Like now, all, now you don't have the, maybe you're not driving to work like you were. Maybe you're going in a couple days a week or whatever. But have you found yourself filling your time, filling your mind space, filling the empty stuff with just more stuff that I got to do? And was it necessary? Like, did you have to do those things? Maybe you did for work. I'm always amazed at the empty space that I'll have. And instead of investing that in a place that God really wants me to, maybe just slowing down the pace of my life, maybe taking some more Sabbath or rest in his presence, I just start filling it with silly things. I know it. New Hope Hawaii Kai, I've probably been saying this too much as an application point in recent weeks and months, but just slowing down, you're like, yeah, 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 Pat, we get it. Go tell New Hope community for a little bit, okay? Well, that's what we're doing. Slow it down. And why slow it down is because when we're slowing down, we can actually hear him. And this is powerful. When you look at the Greek word for obedience, and when you look at the Greek word for, I'm sorry, the Greek word for obedience and the Hebrew word for obedience... Both of those words connect directly with our ability to hear. Both of the words in their meaning connect directly to our ability to hear and respond. But family, if we are moving too fast, we're moving too fast to listen. We're listening to way too many voices or we're listening to the wrong ones. And what we need to do is just listen, dial into his voice. We need to slow That's why doing devotions daily, so powerful. Go on the website and follow the daily devotional reading. It's worth it. Take that hour. Take that 30 minutes. Just get quiet before the Lord. Slow it down. Here's the next thing I want to encourage you with is this. It is so that we're not found at the end, at this judgment day moment. And Jesus is like, I don't even know you. Well, we're going to slow down so that we can do what? So that we can check our heart. That's what I want you to do. I want to check my heart. Check my heart. Do a heart check. Matter of fact, like my man Cube said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Actually, Pastor John really wanted me to quote that, and so you can blame him. I'm just kidding. That's not true. That not happened. I just, I, whatever. Okay, so we got to check ourselves, though. Why? Because we need that assessment. We need to know the motives, the desires, the commitment. Like, where are we in my heart? See, our prayer life will often reveal the state of our relationship. Is it a one-way relationship? One-way talking? God, blah, 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 blah. Do this, do that. I need this, I need that. Or is it a two-way relationship where we're reading his word and he's speaking to us and we're not even saying a word? where we're listening, we're quiet in that place of prayer. I know a lot of us follow that soap, that scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Do we pause just a little bit longer in that prayer moment? Not just to read what we wrote or to say, but just to listen. Show me my sins, God, and just listen to what he said. Show me my motives, Lord, and we just listen to what he said. This is a big one. And again, I know at at our church, this is one that we've been going through just because in this time where so many families and husbands and wives and are home together in each other's spaces, like we, we always thought, oh man, I just love them so much. And until you have to be at home with them every waking moment of your life and you realize, oh my goodness, we're driving each other nuts. But here's the question, how God, 
how can I love my wife today? Lord, if I know you, I'll do what you ask me to do. And, and, and the Bible says that I got to love my wife the way that Christ loves the church. And that is impossible. Jesus, I need you to help me. How, what do I say? How do I love this man? How do I love my husband? How do I bless him today? How do I encourage him? He lost his job. What do I say? God, check my heart. God, how can I use my resources and my gifts and my passion? God, check my agenda. Has this been more about me? Jesus, I'm sorry. Let me ask you a question. What was the last thing that God told you to do? Like, that you can remember. I, what was the last thing God told you to do? You know, because sometimes I hear the question or I hear people say things like, man, I just don't sense God. I don't feel God's presence. I don't feel connected. And many times what I will ask them is, have you followed through on the last thing that God said? You know, we talked about Saul a little bit earlier. And, and <laughs> actually, Samuel asks this question of Saul. He says, why haven't you just simply obeyed the Lord? Why didn't you do? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? And Saul says he did obey. I actually did obey the Lord, but he just changed the plan a little bit. And, and with God, it's his way. It's not our way. <laughs> and so then what happens when Saul exercises that moment of disobedience, when he decides that his plan is actually better than God's plan? And I don't know, maybe he was anxious. Maybe he was afraid he wasn't going to get blessed or protected. Or maybe he was just straight up arrogant, like, I'm the man of the hour. I can handle this. Either way, this is Samuel's response. Rebellion is as sinful as, as witchcraft. <laughs> what? And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he's rejected you as king. Here's the deal, fam. He's connecting disobedience which, with, with witchcraft. My way for worshiping the idol of self or other things to get what I wanted. See, even delayed obedience is a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. God, just give me, come on, come on. I got it. It's okay. Would you just leave me alone, Holy Spirit? I'll take care of it when I'm ready. <laughs> Look, even delayed obedience has consequences, fam. And I want to be someone, even in all of my imperfection, that just says, you know what? I want quick obedience on my part with Jesus. And so I got to check my heart. Where has it been? Because obedience to what God said first actually prepares me for what's next. It's going to help me in my walk with Jesus. It's going to get me closer. And so then what do we do then? So if we got to slow down and we got to check our heart, we got to just simply do this. And this is the last thing. And we're going to close in just a minute or two. It's just take one step. Isn't it simple? Take one step. One step of humility. One step of forgiveness. Maybe that's what God is actually asking you to do. God is actually saying, the will of my Father is that we would be a people that live under an ethic of radical forgiveness for people, even for those that have wounded us, hurt us, that we should have a legitimate grievance against. And yet Jesus says, forgive your enemy? Whew. Now you're stepping on my toes, Jesus, because you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know what they said about me in our friends' circles. What, what do you mean forgive? Maybe we just take a step of forgiveness. He's not asking you to climb Mount Everest. But maybe that simple step will feel like it. It might challenge you. It might offend you. That's okay. Let it offend you. And then bring that offense to Jesus. He loves that stuff. He wants to heal it. He wants to take care of it. But maybe it's just that one step. Maybe it's one step of follow through. The step of, of following through on, on, on prioritizing our family the way that we know we need to. That could be an expression of a gospel transformed life where now because God is the one thing, He begins to order our lives in the right 
order. And now, instead of giving, spending our energy on mediocre pursuits and empty rewards, we actually invest into the treasures that actually matter in life. We start actually putting our treasure in heaven and depositing it there. Because sometimes when we're spending our energy everywhere else, what's left over? Maybe an entitlement? Maybe we just need to relax from being so busy from those mediocre pursuits and those things that we shouldn't be doing anyway. Or maybe we're just anxious because we see there's a tension that what I'm doing isn't working and I don't know why. And I just say, what has God asked you to do? Don't, don't even listen to me. Don't even listen to me. What is God asking us to do? It's so easy. I, I, I'm on the camera. I'm looking at you right now, and you're in your living room. And it's so easy. I got an answer. There's bullets on the screen. And at the end of the day, you and me, we have but one choice. Will we respond to the truth of who Jesus is? Will we let him shape us and mold us into his image instead of trying to make God into ours? Maybe it's one step of genuine repentance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, that I've been living life my own way. And I want to live it your way. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I want my, I'm, I'm the throne of my life. I need me off of it. And I need you, Jesus. I'm surrendering to your leadership. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching this and that's you. And I want you to know if that's you, then that's me too. That all of us are equalized under the glory and the power of God's goodness and his grace. And because of that, the only appropriate response is that we just yield our lives and our hearts to Him. Under any other circumstance, this might be considered almost like God strong-arming us into worship or something, but, but when you consider the grace of God, when you consider that we didn't do anything to deserve it, when you consider that God crosses human history and and the universe, like he extends his very own son to die for us. Well, that kind of love, the only, the only response is to love him back. It's to surrender our agenda and our will and our life and say, you know what, you gave that for me? God, I want to give mine to you. And so maybe that's you. And maybe that step is simply believing in Jesus and trusting that what Jesus said about himself was true, that he was the son of God, that we get to God through him. That trusting what even Romans says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we are saved. If we confess our sin, he is faithful. He is just. He is merciful. And he'll forgive us. And it just might sound like this. God, forgive me. Just take away anything that is in between you and me. God, I'm sorry. Sorry for living my life my way. Forgive me for that sin. I believe you, Jesus. I believe you died on that cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I, I believe that you're inviting me into relationship God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can live the abundant life that you promised? Jesus, I, I want to live for you. I don't want to be found on that day. You looking at me saying, I didn't know you. Jesus, I want to know you. Look, if, you, if, that, if your heart reflects even those words, if you maybe even you prayed that in this moment, would you let us know? Look, whether you're, it's in the comments 
uh, section, whether you're, you're, you're on the chat section, there's a button that might come up. Click it. Let us know that you are saying, I want to commit my life to Jesus. I promise you it won't be easy necessarily and it won't be perfection, but you will have a connection with God that will transform you from the inside out. You'll never be the same. And we, and New Hope Community Church at New Hope Hawaii Kai, we would love to walk with you in your next steps of faith. <laughs> New Hope, thank you so much just for giving me a chance to share my heart. God bless you. We're praying for you. We love you. And we will see you soon.